I like it when we have toys that are this big and detailed because first off, it's really obvious that it's supposed to be Aeoplocephalus, partially because they included the name on the belly of the creature. But I can start off with, hey, this is actually pretty accurate and, and they've gone to the level of detail that you would want in a nice dinosaur toy, but then I can also talk about why all of those details are wrong. So let's get to it. Aeoplocephalus was an ankylosaurid from the late Cretaceous period in Alberta, Canada. It was discovered around the turn of the century. We, don't, we haven't talked about ankylosaurids before on the show. We talked about Solidosaurus, but that was an uncle of the ankylosaurids. This is a true member. This was late Cretaceous, which is when they really became really large and very specialized. Like there had been armored dinosaurs for a very, very long time at that point, but between this guy and the later much better known Ankylosaurus, just fully armored, impenetrable death machines walking around. I mentioned that Ankylosaurus was much larger. It was about a third larger than this guy. This was maybe two tons. So it's like the size of a smallish truck walking around. Um, concerning the proportions of the creature, we're not too far off, but the first thing that strikes me is it's extremely rectangular in the dorsal view, and it should be rounder, at least in the main part of the body. Looking at it from, a he from overhead, you should see a much clearer demarcation between neck, body, and then from body to tail. For that matter, the tail is pretty short as well. Also, the neck is too short. Yeah, look the they've given it so short of a neck that it wouldn't even be able to browse without just crouching completely down so that its stomach is on the ground. And that's just terrible. Usually I would yell at them for giving it a sprawled posture, but in the case of Aeoplocephalus, that's pretty accurate. Its front limbs did seem to sprawl out a bit. The posture of the creature isn't bad. It was sort of different from, from a lot of the dinosaurs we have on the show where giving it the, the backward, downward facing hip was, was probably pretty accurate just because of how it carried itself. I've seen different reconstructions about where the highest point of the back would be. As far as I know, this is fine. You'll see it where it'll have a lot of mass over the shoulders, but that doesn't make as much sense to me. The, let's start with the head. Aeoplocephalus refers to the head. You've got Aeo, which is well. Oplo, which if you know anything about ancient Greece, that's same word root as hoplite or hoplon, which is armed. So you have well-armed and then cephalus head. Uh, and it does have a well-armed head. The skull, for starters, was fused much more than you'd see in other dinosaurs. This was common to ankylosaurs, where the hole in front of the eyes and the hole above the eyes were closed and just covered over with this armor. Uh, they've given it kind of too gracile of a head. You, from overhead, it should be, ha, overhead. In a dorsal view, it should be basically an equilateral triangle, but with a broader mouth. Also, the mouth should probably have a beak. It, they, it appears to just have lips and it needs a beak. The armor over the eyes should be much more prominent. That's one of the things that we use to distinguish Aeoplocephalus. Uh, is the, the eyebrow ridges and then the, the ridge right in front of the eye. In profile view, it shouldn't be concave over the snout, it should be convex. And the horns on the back of the head should be projecting backwards more than outwards. While we're at it, the eyes should probably be further back as well. Oh, and the nostrils. The, the nostrils are not bad, actually. They could maybe be further apart on account of the mouth is wider, but they're, they're definitely slit-like, uh, which is accurate. Aeoplocephalus is kind of unique that it has really advanced nasal chambers, and there's some debate as to why. Um, based on analysis of their inner ear, the, they, they had hearing that would be conducive to, oh, they must have been able to produce really specific sounds. So that makes sense that the nose would be complicated so that it can produce honking sounds. Or they might have just had a really good sense of smell, but when we scan the inside of their cranium, 
doesn't seem to support that. Usually you'll see an enlarged, for lack of a better term, smell center. Um, or maybe it was the same reason that mammals have complicated noses. It's to pre-treat incoming air. When you breathe through your nose, it, it, among other things, warms the air that's coming into your body. Oh, and I forgot to mention, it ha um, in addition to the, the eyebrow ridges and the ridges in front of the eyes, it had armored eyelids, or at least we figure it had armored eyelids because we find little bones associated with the skull that don't seem to fit anywhere else. So armored eyelids, that's pretty cool that it could just sort of lid its eyes down and, and nothing could just jab it in the eyes. That's a, a nice adaptation. They've at least given it cheeks, which I approve of because uh, it, it, as far as we can tell, mechanically it had a rather advanced chewing apparatus going on. Uh, and cheeks would be a necessary part of that. Having such a wide mouth, it was probably not very picky about what it put into its mouth, so of course it would have a nice mechanism to grind it up. The feet aren't too bad. They're a little primitive. This was a very derived Ankylosaurin. Uh, they wouldn't be as elephantine or hoof-like or what have you as maybe Stegosaurus would have been, but they weren't this lizard-like. Accurate number of toes, basically. The back feet had four toes apiece, uh, only three of which were hooved. And the front feet had four toes as well, but I think only the inner two had hooves or claws on them. The legs are pretty good proportionally. It had, it had sort of stubby little legs. It might've been a little bit like a hippopotamus in that it was probably faster than it looked. We can't be sure though. It was really heavy, so Maybe it didn't need to move very fast. That's the alternative. They have committed a mistake that you see a lot in dinosaur toys where they'll say, okay, well, it has strong legs. It must be like a monitor lizard and have thick wrists and ankles to accompany those. Not so much. Uh, dinosaur leg muscles were in the legs, which sounds like it makes sense, but why do toy makers keep getting it wrong? So thinner ankles, effectively, thinner wrists and ankles. Still plenty to support the creature, just not so much meat on them. And last but not least, certainly not least, the armament. It is at least recognizable as the pattern that you would assign to Aeoplocephalus. Although I point out that we used to have a lot more samples of Aeoplocephalus, but recently they've been reassigned to other genera. But they're close enough related genre that we can still use them to infer things about Aeoplocephalus due to phylogenetic bracketing, but not as much direct evidence as maybe we would like for this creature. With that caveat, we'll just go head to toe. That's, uh, the neck needs another ring. And I say ring because, as cool as it is, the the four spikes you see uh, on the in between the neck and the body there uh, is a is a one solid semicircle of bone with it should actually have six spikes the first one was thick and only had four spikes and the second one was thinner but but bigger around and obviously this is to protect it from being bitten on the neck along with the spikes on the head incidentally the outermost two spikes on the, the back ring of the neck could be very large. Like, you, you see these huge spikes on the back here in the middle, the, about that size on the, the last set of neck spikes. Moving into the body, the in between the spikes, it also had armor, uh, uh, ossicles is, is what they're called. They're, they're little round bones uh, embedded in the flesh. Uh, I don't know if they were covered in keratin or not. They might have been just in the skin like a crocodile. Not the crocodiles don't have keratin also. Uh, Texture-wise, it would have been like tarmac or asphalt. That said, they've banded it like a armadillo, which is not inaccurate. It, it, did, it would have had creases in the armor so that it could move, uh, but they've given it too many. It should really have like, yeah, like nine bands. Uh, Although one of those bands was over the hip and was very large, it was more like a shield over the hip because the hip was fused together and didn't have a lot of vertical flexibility, so it didn't need banding. When, when you look at the top view, the spikes are sort of proceeding in straight lines. And as previously mentioned, this guy is not accurate in top view, so they should be 
radiating out and then back in at the, the end of the body, like, a, like the lines on a basketball, only more painful. Furthermore, they should be bigger throughout, or, or at least once you get to the, the hip area. They're shaped wrong, too. The, the shape of the spine, except for the ones on the head, which were certainly conical, they should be, they, they would have a round base proceeding up into a, a keel going back towards the tip. So I don't really have a real world analog for that, but I can show you pretty pictures. Furthermore, they've given it these two little spikes about halfway down the tail. Uh, once you're into the tail, there's four increasingly large sets of spikes. And past that point, the tail had reinforcing bony rods to uh, uh, give it stiffness going into the club. And before we talk about the club, one final note on spikes, the ones on the forearm. I'm not clear on arrangement because I see them placed basically wherever the person restoring it felt like it, uh, but they really should be larger, particularly t the top two. And this toy has what you see a lot in ankylosaurids, which is a, a clear ridge demarcating between the armored back and the unarmored belly. That could be accurate. I'm not, I, I'm, I'm willing to say, okay, sure. That's the kind of thing that doesn't really fossilize well. And if you're wondering about the unarmored belly, I might as well mention, we're figuring that the defense for this creature really would have just been, I'm gonna crouch down and swing my tail at you until you go away so I can go back to stuffing my face. Which is fair. It's a successful creature. It's a su successful body plan considering how many ankylosaurs we have. Speaking of the tail, the design of it is pretty accurate. It has the two lobes on the sides and then a, one other big lobe on the, in the middle. Uh, these were osteoderms, by the way. Osteoderms are just what it sounds like, bone skin. They're, they're bones that develop in the skin as the animal matures. So it would have had a smaller tail club when it was a juvenile and then a larger one throughout its life. Uh, I can pretty confidently say that this is way too small. That's basically everything I wanted to cover about Aeoplocephalus. Thank you for watching, your dinosaurs are wrong. Like, comment, subscribe, tell me dinosaurs to take a part on the show, send me a toy dinosaur, our address is in the description. Uh, even go to thegeekgroup.org to find out how you can become a member and donate, and we'll see you next time. This video was made possible by a grant from the Future Girl Foundation. This video was made possible by thousands of private donations from members and viewers like you. Please visit thegeekgroup.org for more information on how you can donate and become a part of our dreams of Avalon.